This is Pixelated Audio, Expansion Pack 7. Related audio, a uh, video game music and retro gaming podcast. I'm Brian. And I'm James. And today we have a special guest with us on this expansion pack. Richard, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Richard. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me. No I'm probably one of the podcasts. I've been listening to you guys for a little bit. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to listen to some video game music with you guys and talk about them. It's cool to see other video game music lovers. And uh, we're glad to have you on. When I first heard from you on, I think it was Twitter, you messaged me and you're like, hey, do you guys, you guys record in the area? Could I, could I come check out a show? Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, why don't, why don't you just join the show? Why don't you just be on? And you were, you were stoked about it. So glad, glad it worked out and we're, we're getting together and jammed to some video game music. Right. Now you're actually uh, uh, active on our Instagram as well, right? Yeah. I follow you guys on there. Nice. And Cool. I, I like stuff. On there. Yeah. <laughs> you like stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So today's show, we have a bunch of different randomly picked tracks I think I have some surprises for both of you guys. Nice. Maybe not. Maybe not at all, actually. I don't know. Well, we'll see. Yeah, so uh, why don't you tell us about the track we came in with, Richard? This is a, your track that you picked for us. Yeah, sure. This was from Shinobi 3. The track's called Whirlwind. Mm -hmm. I think this is from the surfing stage, it's known as. You're you're like surfing through water and just jumping over stuff. It's like platform, but you're yeah, going high speeds and uh, nice. Sounds very nineties. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's no, totally is, great imagery. And this is a, this is an awesome track. I'm glad you picked it because I had to listen to it a few times because that stop in there, that that sudden pause, mm -hmm. is is wild. And I was like, oh man, am I having on like a playback problem? I yeah, that's what I thought might have, at first too that it might have been some type of a glitch or something like that. But uh, no, it's pretty cool. I mean, yeah, it's wild. I mean, I, this track, I just, I thought it was a great track for the, the for the beginning of the episode. It's very, uh, exactly what I love about the Genesis and it's got that great synth and it's very montage feeling, which I, <laughs> yeah. for me, that's always big. I love like that montage feel that the nineties always had with stuff. Yeah. So, uh, this was definitely a great track. Do you actually have the composer list with you? Yeah. It's Hirofumi Murasaki, Morihiko Akiyama and Masayuki Nagao. Oh, that's right. So why'd you pick this track? I think just, yeah. Cause it's that real driving rock sound and yeah. um i don't know this is one that i just got hooked on a year ago or so when i uh -huh. when i found it but the stops definitely kind of caught my ear and it just that like little millisecond of perfect silence in between it's, all the loud rock it was something that yeah. just really caught my attention and helps drive the rest of the little riff there so richard uh, could you tell us like what kind of like gamer you are and what kind of stuff you listen to on like more regular basis yeah, sure. I um I got into video game music maybe three or four years ago now, and I've I've never been humongous into games, playing games. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I should say that because I do play a lot of video games. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't play like a huge variety, and I don't have a bunch of retro consoles and stuff. Uh -huh. Right. Um, but I kind of grew up on N sixty four. Right. Nineties kid, all that late nineties um stuff, and then just Xbox and that kind of stuff. And cool. uh, but I really like the retro video game music style a lot more mm -hmm. more like chiptune mm -hmm. chiptune music very melodic yeah so i just started getting really into researching all that finding all these great podcasts right like your guys's and i got really hooked on legacy music hour a few years ago very cool and uh so yeah i just started at it, trying to look up all those songs on the internet trying to add them to my library and and yeah i think it's a really cool genre of, of style that unfortunately a lot of people don't know about yet but right, it, right there's a ton of music out there from this and yeah so like all five of our listeners you know there's <laughs> they they found uh, a lot about uh video game music but uh you know there's still a huge world out there who has you know no no idea about or how awesome like game 
audio can be. Right. No, so. I meet a lot of people and, you know, they ask, what, what do you do? And, you know, what kind of stuff do you do outside of work? And because I'm very active outside of work, I do a lot of freelance stuff for artwork. And, and I also say, oh, you know, me and a, a buddy co-host a uh, video game music podcast. And as soon as they hear video game music, they shut off. They're just like, 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 like nope. podcast is enough, like people that have podcasts. And then as soon as they hear video game music podcast, there's like, yeah, I'm, I am done asking you lost questions. Me. So. You lost me at video game music. <laughs> Anyways, so that was an awesome track. Uh, why don't we get into our next? James, what do you have on the list? Uh, I'm going to go with a track from Punisher on the Amiga called Game Over. You just heard a track from Punisher on the Amiga called Game Over, composed by Steve Hassler and Dave Hassler. That was wild, dude. That electric guitar, that synth. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. Those sustained notes were just out of this world. I love it. Yeah, I wanted to keep that very 90s vibe going. Yeah, it's and it's not like an overly aggressive track. It's really just... Super mellow. Really yeah. mellow, yeah. Well, and I was surprised, too. This is the... Like I said, this is the Game Over screen, so you've died and the game is over. Um, and there's only two tracks in this entire game, which I think is the title screen and game over screen. Right. So there's no music throughout the game. But uh, I, I just heard this track and I was thinking, man, if I played this game and I died, which I was going to die, um, I would just sit there. I would probably never yeah, turn it never off. Never resume. Yeah. I mean, I just this track just hit me really, really good. It just was so synth and, like you said, mellow. I really loved the... Uh, the bass beat that was in the background was just super cool. Very, very cool. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I like that kind of slow rock feel. Yeah. And um, there, was, there was no drum sounds for the first bit. The intro was just all those synth and the bass and like those arpeggios. Yeah. Going on oh, in that's, the background. Uh, that's like the Amiga love right there. Mm -hmm. Oh, that It's like that sustained high-pitched noise. I, get, I think that like touches my heart some way. It's, mm -hmm. so, it's so awesome, dude. It just sounds so good. Any anything else about that? Track? Yeah, I have some. Uh, this was the the first game that I researched for this episode, and I came across a whole bunch. Uh, not so much about the game itself. Like I said, there's not really any other music. It's a very uh, Doom style Punisher game, so it's a first. So person. totally different than the arcade. Yeah, and it has nothing to do with any of that. And actually, uh, it didn't look like it played very well. A lot of the people that I'd saw for the playthroughs were comments were just like, "Wow, this game is terrible," or "I hated this game," or there were some people that said they liked it, but. Just from the look of it, it's very bland looking, very muted colors. The, the movement is really choppy, stuff like that. But I found a lot of interesting stuff about the company that made it, which this was made by a company called Edge Games. Mm -hmm. And um, so what I found was that their their CEO by the name of Tim Langdell is very kind of infamous for his business practices around the trademark of the word the edge or edge Wait, known what so so he's trademarked the word edge and he says uh, he, could you trademark a word i don't know he says he has the global trademark for the word edge and anyone that uses edge in anything not just games is liable for him to sue them so he's had run-ins with companies like um let's see uh ea damco marvel sony and just so many more 
where so he's kind of a patent troll yeah yeah uh. so like uh, on their website they even have a list of things that they have claimed the license to like there was um velocity micros pc engine or pc edge uh datel's the edge Wii controller which i guess is a like a knockoff Wii controller right okay. um 20th century fox's the edge starring anthony hopkins says that they own the license oh, to, the, to use the word the edge for that and just so many other things um they've taken over comic books and i read where this um I actually didn't write down the name of the company that did this iOS game called Edge. Uh-huh. Um, they had one of the worst experiences with them. They had made a game. They got contacted and were told by this company, The Edge, that you have to take it down or we're going to sue you. And they said, well, what if we change the name to Edgy? And this was a conversation between the CEO of that company and the CEO of The Edge. And he said, no, it's too similar. And then they went and filed a patent or a trademark for the word Edgy. God. Um, and then they, I'm so starting they, to like like this this developer less and less. Yeah, no, and then they uh, there was this whole big battle. The, the game went up and then it came down and went up. They changed the name to Edgy, and then it came down and it was just ridiculous. But now I guess they've they have the game back up and they have no worries and they are very proud that they've helped make it easier for anyone. So I mean, they were going after anything that had the name Edge in it. Like right. Namco had a game out that had Edge in it, and they came they went again after them like soul edge or something. Yeah, and yeah. They, and then they changed the name and just even though they didn't have to they changed it just to kind of get these people out of their hair and uh, it's just like i mean they, he goes after everyone which is crazy so i was just like oh my god this is so much drama it's like a it's so scandal crazy. yeah like, that, seems, that seems like unfair unless you invented the word edge yeah, yeah. it doesn't like, seem yeah, right to it feels me. like a, a mixture of two words which i think that is totally legit but it i guess he was part of the international game developers association and he was a chairman on the board and so he, was, he had some influence and power yeah. anyway so he was actually they voted to remove him so he got removed and then he said oh i stepped down and then they actually revoked his membership so he's no longer a part <laughs> of the organization so and That's they said awesome. due to unethical behavior so i mean this guy I don't know, it almost seemed like he had a screw loose or something so I mean, just I mean, it, that's kind of the way the Punisher operates too. So I thought that was like perfect. But they have a whole bunch of other licenses. They did some like Snoopy and Garfield games, and they've been around since the the eighties. So yeah, no, very cool, super drama. So now I think it's time for another track. What do you have lined up, Brian? Uh, so I pick. This is something I normally wouldn't pick. Um, this is actually from Pokemon Crystal on the Game Boy Color, and this is called. This track is called You Seen's Theme. I think I'm saying that right. You Seen. You see, mm. uh, there's got to be some Pokemon trainers out there who are, are like, oh, my God, he's pronouncing yeah. my favorite theme wrong. No, but uh, so this is UC theme. Let's listen to that and we'll be right back. <laughs> Scenes theme from Pokemon Crystal on the Game Boy Color, composed by Junichi Masuda, Go Ichinose, and Morikazu Aoki. Very nice, nice chip tune. Something a little bit new to listen to. Um, yeah, I, you know, I wouldn't normally pick a, a Pokemon track, and and the reason why is not nothing against Pokemon. Mm-hmm. I, I love Pokemon; it's really great. But um, it's not something that it's such a big and kind of overwhelming franchise. Well, it has that, millions of fans worldwide that are crazy and yeah it. and and this game i don't have a lot of experience with actually none so i i was kind of hesitant to to you know pick a track that i'm gonna have to talk a little bit about but uh without without knowing anything but the track is super fun i, I love those scales it's it's really fun what did you what do you think about that richard i thought it was i thought it was cool it's a little bit different than other pokemon tracks i've heard because i too am unfamiliar with the crystal version. right 
but yeah, it had kind of a, a lot of variety. It changed parts pretty frequently, so it wasn't too repetitive. Just kept moving along, and yeah, it had that a little bit of classic Pokemon sound, but also a little bit different style from what I've heard from Pokemon. A little bit like kind of a straightforward rock and like ninja e. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, I know. I get. I get what you mean there. Yeah, it's just really fun. I mean, it's a fun me, track. I don't have a lot of experience with any Pokemon. I mean, I missed out a lot of it. And so I've been playing some of the more recent stuff and like Pokemon Pinball and X and Y and stuff like that. But it's just a very fun track, a very fun game. Like it's just I, you feel good kind of playing the games, which is cool. I, I have no experience with this game, but I do have some experience with Red and Blue. And that's what kind of got me into it. This is before like the whole Pokemon craze started. Mm-hmm. I remember my uh, my friends, we were kind of reading like uh, Nintendo Powers and stuff that would be talking about this game called Pocket Monsters. And we didn't know anything about the game yet, but we kept seeing like screenshots and we heard like, oh, you can like capture all these different things. And it hadn't been done yet. Something like right. that hadn't been done yet. And so we got really into it. And when it came out, we had a blast with like Red and Blue. And then the, kind of the, the Pokemon craze hit and it was kind of seen as more like a like a kid's kind of franchise right. so i i dropped off i was like i don't know maybe this isn't my thing anymore and it wasn't until like x and y that i i picked it up again but it, it was really cool published by the pokemon company and developed by game freak and it came out in 2000 in japan and 2001 in north america the composer jun ichi masuda he's done a lot of the pokemon games mm-hmm. in fact these all three composers did a lot of stuff together and they did you know like Crystal, Sapphire, Ruby, Sapphire, and all all those other Pokemon games, m- pretty much most of them. I just like the, the way that they compose stuff. I think all the Pokemon music, from what I've heard, is just, it's fun. It's really well thought out. It's mm-hmm. very high quality. There's not a lot of tracks that uh, you get bored with, I think. Right. And even like the the music where you like run around towns and stuff like that, it's uh, usually pretty, pretty uplifting and it, it keeps you wanting to listen. It keeps you wanting to play. And if it got boring, then, you know... It, it would drive people nuts, but hearing stuff out of that Game Boy Color speaker. Oh, of course. Sounds, Love the... sounds pretty good. So let me tell you a little bit about the game. It's actually an updated version of two previous games, which were Pokemon Gold and Pokemon Silver. Basically, what this adds is, I guess it adds a few animation stuff. This is only for the Game Boy Color. Mm-hmm. So the, the previous versions were for just the black and white Game Boy and then Super Game Boy. You could play it on, you know, through your yeah. Super Nintendo. But this version was for Game Boy Color only, so it was kind of special. They added more animations, some sprite effects. But the the big difference is that you could also play as a female in this game. Oh, nice. So I thought I thought that was pretty cool because this is kind of a big stride. Because in the previous Pokemon games, you only could play as a male. And since the the game and the series has become such a you know a worldwide kind of phenomenon, I think that not being able to play as a female character is kind of a hindrance for the for the company. Yeah, it would kind of alienate some of their fan base, which are now a growing population of female gamers, which is cool. Yeah, so what's also kind of cool about this game is, and it kind of makes me want to kind of look into it a little more, is that, so this takes place three years after Blue and Red. Blue and Red take place in the Kanto region, which is like Tokyo area. This game actually takes place in the Kansai region, it, like where Osaka and Kyoto, mm-hmm. that's where I used to live. What's really cool is, so if you beat all the gym leaders and um, I guess the the Elite Four and, you know, what have you, I don't really know the, the whole plot there, but you can go and fight some gym leaders or battle some gym leaders in the Kanto region from the previous games. Nice. And what, what's neat about it is you can actually see how the world has changed, I guess, over the three years since the previous version. So I think that adds like a really cool, like, especially if you play the previous games, right? you can, you can see like, oh, wow, like the city is like changed or you know like things of like you know, this tree grew or i don't know right but. it's just a neat idea to to see that after you're done playing a game that those characters are still living and doing things and now you know years later they've kind of evolved and grown or or you know their lives are still continued which is a neat concept i think yeah and you know this company you know game freak they're, they're very clever and they they know how to kind of play all these really awesome like classic style cards on what would fans like? And mm-hmm. I think that, that that was a really cool thing. Anyways, we're getting a little long here. Actually, I'm going on a little <laughs> yeah. a little too much. But uh, why don't we get into our next track? This is a track you picked, Richard, right? Uh, yeah, the next track I wanted to play today is uh, from Pebble Beach Golf Links. I believe from the Genesis version. This is the menu theme. Awesome. Let's check it out.
All right, so that was the menu theme from uh, Pebble Beach Golf Links, which came out for Genesis in 1993, I believe. Awesome track. Super yeah. jazzy. I loved it. It was composed by Yumi Kinoshita, Shigekazu Kamaki, and Yusa Budo Shimojo. Nice. Yeah, I really liked it. It's a very different track for um, from what we've been playing today. It's very kind of elevator music. It, oh, man, it's, it's super elevator yeah, music. Yeah, it's like very menu sounding. Like, yeah. I probably would have been able to guess this was a menu theme. Yeah. Because it just reminds me of kind of being in an elevator or at the mall. Like, Yeah, you know, it's, it's very, like, very jazzy. I feel like I should have like some kind of like, like a martini in my hand mm-hmm. and I should be out at the, the golf course. <laughs> Uh, way cool. I dig that track. That was cool. We we started listening to it and we all kind of smiled. We we're just like, oh yeah. Well, and then when is... the uh, like the xylophone or whatever part kicks in, yeah. we all kind of like looked at it. You're like, what? Uh, what? Like that was yeah. pretty cool. It almost it, like it almost had like a was between like xylophone and like steel drum almost kind of like, yeah. it, like they were kind of like in between and like I thought it was that was that was yeah. way cool. Yeah, no, I love that how they switch off the solos, uh, the solo instruments. They mm-hmm. they take turns doing a little solos and that middle one that. I think it's like a fake vibraphone. I think that's the instrument mm-hmm. from like sure. a jasmine. Yeah, just, <laughs> yeah, it sounds cool how they like imitate the rolls and everything. And yeah. I love that that punchy bass from the Genesis sound on this one too. And so there's something about that bass on Genesis that always it, it, it can be either really really good, sound like this just deep synth sound that just sounds awesome, and have mm-hmm. like they also have really cool slap bass stuff in a lot of Genesis tracks. But then it can also sound really bad. And yeah. like really splatty, and sometimes Genesis has that that kind of uh, I want to say plague. Composers kind of hit that that splat sound every now and yeah. then. It doesn't sound as good, but I think this is a good example of how the Genesis should sound for for like bass right. and stuff. I think that's way awesome. Well, and I mean, and you had that Shinobi track too that was just perfect Genesis. And so um, I mean, this track is so different, and it's just it like we said, it's very fun. It's kind of mellow, like it seems to put you in a good mood, which for golf games, they're not very exciting for the most part. And Well, it's not action-based, right? right? But so, but you want to be kind of in a good, even keel mood to you know hit mm-hmm. the, the meters the right way and stuff like that. So uh, I've never actually played this, this actual golf game. Have, have you played this? I haven't played this, actually, no. I just kind of discovered the track. And um, actually, I wanted to show this one today because this is one of the first tracks I listened to when I was getting into video game music. Right. Nice. This is one of the first tracks where I was just kind of blown away a little bit since you don't really get to hear this kind of music elsewhere yeah it's kind yeah of like elevatory jazzy type stuff mm-hmm. and uh, i was just like wow this is what video game music could be and it could be all these other type of genres too so yeah there's there's no limit on what video game music can can be and i think it's really cool that you know games have their own genres and mm-hmm. stuff like that but no none of the music has to conform to any certain rule and right. i think that's what's what's awesome like you can have a golf game with not only jazz, but you can have stuff like Valor Valley, which is a lot more like, like heavy fast, and, yeah. heavy metal kind of stuff. And and I think that that you 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 nailed it on the head. Like that's that's awesome. That's way cool about how uh, game music should be perceived by the mass. Right. And one thing that I like about it too is that like within the game music world, there's there's some games that it's like you know platform stuff like that. People are like oh the music is going to be awesome. Let me check this out. But then a lot of people don't realize that sports games have amazing music racing games have amazing music like, like pro wrestling games, yeah, yeah like, like, like the gamut there's, there's pretty much every genre of game can have amazing music and you kind of can't judge a game by its cover or whatever <laughs> so it's like just check it out and i mean something even for kids i think one of our first expansion packs i played a david wise track from um, uh, Sesame, Sesame Street, Street. and it's yeah. just like this track is awesome, but yeah, it's that like was cool. that I would cool never track. really play this game. That, but that's what that's that track that I had in my head for like two weeks after. Thank you very much. James. Yeah, no, it was cool. Hey, but you're next on the list, so what do you got? I'm actually going to go with a track from the Wonder Swan Color from a game called Guilty Gear Petite, and the track is Option. <laughs> Thank you. 
just heard the options track from Guilty Gear Petite on the Wonder Swan Color, composed by Takayuki Nakamura. Wow, dude, that was wild. Yeah. That drum that drum solo. Yeah, that was, was that was that, really unexpected. It was very cool. That driving sound is is pretty persistent the whole mm-hmm. way, and then everything cuts out. Mm-hmm. And you get that that just going off. That was that was wild. I like that. Yeah, no, I had this on random and it was just working. And when this track came on, I was like, wow, this is cool. Like really fast energy, fast paced. And then that drums track just kind of that solo just kind of brought me to I had to I had to write this track down. So and then when I saw it was Wonder Swan, I was like, oh, I have to play this. So, yeah, I love the the drums that are like a really fast tempo. And then mm-hmm. they kind of like cut do some cut time stuff, switch up the tempo. And then that little breakdown where it's just all that little drum program sounded really cool and then there's a lot of there's a lot of voices going on with those mm-hmm. those synthy leads all complementing each other it's yeah really, really fun to listen to yeah it's very cool and it's it's cool to hear it through headphones because i had a wonder swan i i still have a wonder swan i didn't have this game but uh the wonder swan didn't have a headphone jack on mm-hmm. it you had to buy the accessory separately <laughs> nice. so it's cool that we are able to uh listen to that that track and all of its uh stereo glory yeah i mean on a lot of those little handhelds the speakers weren't that great so you lost a lot of the sound so to be able to hear it like this is awesome like i mean the composer i looked into him and didn't find a whole lot of stuff Uh, i saw that he was listed as a composer for virtual fighter but other than that he was listed for just like music and sound for other games like Like sound design and yeah like tobal 2 um eswat city under siege he did Guilty Gear Petite 2, Star Ocean, Blue Sphere, okay. um, Kengo, the master of the Bushido. So, okay. um, so he had t- like not a ton of games, but some pretty cool stuff. Yeah. No, that was a that was a really rad track. And I think this might be the first time we had a Wonder Swan uh, yeah, track on, so. the, on the show. I, we have a ton of music to choose from, but I guess this is our, our first time picking that. Yeah. So and this game came out in 2001 and it was um, developed by Arc System Works published by Sammy. So it's, I mean, and if you're not familiar with Guilty Gear, the Guilty Gear series, it's a, a 2D fighting game. So um, really wild, wacky. Yeah. I, I played a lot of Guilty Gear, um, not in the arcade so much, which is where I first, I, I think it first came out, but I played it a lot on the Dreamcast and I was a real big fan of Guilty Gear because the moves, the specials, the characters, they were yeah. all so just crazy and like way out there and it was just very twisted like, yeah, they're hyper stylized. Like, yeah, um, and in this game, they because they're on the handheld, they fall into that. Uh, I guess it's referred to as the deform style, but it's very cute. Oh, the um, SD. Yeah, yeah, like the, you know, it's got the uh, like the gem fighters look to it. Right, right. Um, it just looked really cool. The the colors looked great on this game, from what I could see. The the fighting looked very fun. So was this for the Wonder Swan color? Yeah. Okay, I got gotcha. you. And um, this is Japan only, so it never came here. Well, but, uh, I mean, neither did the Wonder Swan. Right. So. so um, so the, it wasn't a game that most of us would have had a, a huge opportunity to play. So I thought this was a great track to, no. to bring to the show. It was it was very cool. So what do you have lined up next, Brian? So the track that I'm going to play next is from Zach, the art of visual stage for the MSX. And the track is called Path to the Fort. This is a really cool track because we haven't had any MSX right. tracks yet. It's just uh, this this sound or this song actually kind of jumped out to me when I was listening. The thing about the MSX that makes it really unique is the audio system is handled by the AY38910 chip on or that was made by General Instruments. It's the same one used in the ZX Spectrum. Okay. Yeah. So it provides three different channels of PSG sound. But later on, they developed a standard for the MSX called MSX Music. And that added the FM based sound generation. And that was around like 1987, I think, using OPLL. And OPL is basically just a Yamaha 2413 chip. And that's basically a stripped down like OPL2 chip. Mm -hmm. So, you know, without getting too much into the hardware side of it, they were trying to make a chip for the MSX that they could produce something that that was very, very cheap, but they could start pumping out and getting more people to use in their in their games, in their hardware. This game makes use of that chip. So it's not just using the standard MSX PSG sounds of three channels. It's actually using all the extra channels that are allows the composers to to work with. So it adds a lot more richness to the track. So. I wanted to kind of preface this track a little bit before mm-hmm. we before we played it, so the listeners have something to uh, kind of have in the back of their mind, you guys too. So this track is called "The Path to the Fort." <laughs>
just heard Path to the Fort from Zach, The Art of Visual Stage on the MSX, composed by Tadahiro Nita and Yuji Sasai. Wow. Pretty rad, huh? Yeah. It's a pretty, mean, pretty wild track. Like, I, I heard this and it just, I, you know, the, the whole game, the, the music in the game is, is really, really well done. I mean, this is, they really mastered that OPLL mm-hmm. I am on the MSX. I think it was just so well done. It was developed and published by Micro Cabin. So they've, they've done little things here and there, but um, they're mostly well known, I think, for the Zach series. Mm-hmm. Um, I like that track a lot because it had that kind of fast beat, that fast drum beat right. throughout the whole time. That's kind of like a punk metal beat. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was doing a little air guitar. <laughs> yeah. yeah that was i love the me- melodic kind of sounds like melodic guitars like soloing and stuff yeah i love that that fast beat though there's a lot of scales again and mm-hmm. i i think that that's that's really cool because so fast they actually fit into like the time signature correctly like 30 seconds 64 i don't know what they are but they're they're so quick in there that you could you could miss them but your ear is still kind of picking up that that noise i think it's just so rad and this was a, a very fun and uh kind of quick moving track right no this track kind of um i I really really enjoyed it it like overloaded my brain like when i was trying to write down notes and by the time i was you know got a few letters out for whatever i was writing the next part was just kept constantly blowing (laughs) my mind so i didn't get a whole lot written down other than i mean it's just great drums awesome melody The, the way that you brought in the track it really helped to understand how they produced so much you like know, rich, in this track, I, yeah. mean, I mean, you wouldn't have ex- expected the MSX to do this, I guess, unless yeah. you kind of knew that this is a little bit, you know, extra going on and all these extra tracks and, you know, voices channels going on and, and stuff. Channels. Yeah. yeah, it's just totally nuts. I mean, but it was a very well organized track. It wasn't just crazy chaos, um, which is very cool to see so many notes and so many instruments playing together. It just was really awesome. Yeah. So this game is actually an action RPG. It came out in 1989. It was originally for the PC-88 that came out the same year in 89, but then it got ported over to a bunch of other systems like the PC Engine, the SARP X68000, and the Super Famicom, and you know just a kind of a bunch of other stuff. I think Windows had a few different mm-hmm. ports and stuff as well. Uh, Micro Cabin, they, they just nailed it with this game. I think this was like kind of their introduction into... like It got them really well known in Japan as mm-hmm. a, like a profound you know, game development and publishing house and i think that the the composition also just really succeeded yuji sasai he is the main composer for this game he started off really young doing stuff like anime and like some you know other tv shows and just kind of like i guess um jingles and stuff here and there mm-hmm. but he was sending out tons of like demos and tapes and resumes out to different game companies to kind of get a job in game audio and uh, he gets a call from Micro Cabin to do freelance work, and he ends up doing all the scores for pretty much all the Zach games. Mm-hmm. So that that really really helped, and that's where he started working alongside Tadahiro Nita, doing the rest of the composition. So I think I'm not sure if Tadahiro did a lot of the actual composition, or if he was doing sound drivers or or what. But uh, they do seem to be paired together for all these Zach games. The thing about Sasai is that you probably would know him actually from Square because he ended up leaving from doing freelance and he mm-hmm. went over to Square, Squaresoft at the time, to help out with Uematsu and Kenji Ito nice. doing stuff. Oh. So his first job was the soundtrack for Final Fantasy Legend 3 on the Game Boy. Wow. And uh, he composed all but four tracks of Final Fantasy Mystic Quest on the Super Nintendo. Wow. Yeah, nice. so he, he did a lot. And then he also did Bushido Blade 2 soundtrack, which awesome. is which is amazing Mm -hmm. it's a great soundtrack and uh i guess they had some other stuff planned for him like to compose but he ended up leaving in 1998 so but i mean he's a very well-known composer for for those specific squaresoft titles so i think that's really rad yeah so the game itself the story I, i won't get too deep into it it's an rpg and basically years ago the god duel the god's name is duel he defeated this evil demon named badu and he encased him in a mountain of ice. And so in this in this story, the specific game, I guess it's the first chapter in the in the series, Badu managed to escape from the prison, that mm-hmm. ice prison, and demons have kind of overrun the land. So get this, the the king asks a warrior named Dork Cart. <laughs> Dork to, Cart. <laughs> yeah, to step in and save the land. Dork Cart. I, I don't know if that's a mistranslation or just nice. you know, I I don't know. But um, anyways, Dork is, God, I can't even <laughs> say that. 
Uh, Dork is missing for whatever reason, and his 16 year old son, Latok, decides to go in his place. Nice. So it's just like a kid, and he's like, okay, I'm, my, my, my dad's not here. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and, and, and take over. Stop me if you know this story. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so, anyways, you play as Latok, and you travel through the world exploring different environments and defeating different enemies along the way until you reach Badu. But the game itself looks a lot like, um, I want to say, like Fantasy Star on the Genesis. So, if you want to kind of compare it, like the. The, the graphics are really well done. They look mm-hmm. very vibrant. The colors are very pretty. Um, the text is is very clear and easy to read. And the, the environments themselves are very well laid out. So nice. it's a game that I missed. I never actually played it. But the soundtrack for this game actually got released, like a CD release. And it mm-hmm. has like, like I think, 42 tracks. Nice. Yeah, so it was Japan only. But, I mean, that's, that's cool. I mean, a lot of people like the sound. So yeah. it's cool that it got released. Anyways, moving on. We have uh, another track from... Richard here. So what do we have next, Richard? Um, let's see. I'd like to play a track from Game Boy Camera. Awesome. This should be the, uh, the ending and credits. So yeah, that was uh, from Game Boy Camera. That was the ending and credits themes. Very um, cool. Yeah, I love that track. That's super kind of like poppy rock, mm-hmm. very slowed down, but really catchy, super pop melody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, very that's chill. so fun. That's that's a really rad track. And the Game Boy Camera just has a ton of, I mean, it even has a make your own music program built into it. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I don't if, really know anything about the Game Boy Camera. I had a Game Gear growing up, so I didn't have a Game Boy. So. Yeah. There's a lot of um, people who are doing like video game, like chiptune, like mm-hmm. new music and stuff. And they're using Game Boy Camera, the built in software to create wow. their own chiptunes. Yeah. Cool. It's, it's really rad. You can, I mean, it's very, very like deep and detailed. There's a lot you can do. I'll have to show you later. Yeah, it's, it's I'm really going to cool. get one. Yeah. Anyways, do you uh, do you know who it was composed by? Yeah. So this was, I think this was a team of composers. Um, 
probably led by Hirokazu Tanaka. I know he was like the music director. That, that makes sense for this, yeah. And there's a couple other people that worked on this. Um, Manako Hamano and uh, Kentaro Nishimura. And so I'm not sure exactly who had a hand in, in these Like two who cool contributed tracks, to what, yeah. But um, let's see, this came out in 1998. And I, I do know there is a story behind this track. And people have found connections between that melody. I'm glad used. you're, bring, I'm yeah. glad you're going to bring this up because I think I know what you're going to touch on. Yeah, there's uh, people have found connections between this melody used with another uh, game that Hirokazu Tanaka is very famous for composing all the music for or and, most of the music for. And, and uh, uh, do you know what game that is? I believe that's the mother right edition of that series <laughs> yeah no i had to look it up too because i was so curious and it's yeah. actually uh twinkle elementary school i think is the name of the track and do, do you guys want to hear it real quick yeah yeah i'd like to hear it i don't think i've heard it but i've just read about the connection yeah so so you can kind of compare so let me let me fire it up here i don't really hear any similarity yet but i think like i think it this right is there. it. Yeah, yeah. There you go. That's so cool. Yeah. I wonder if, like, when they were composing this, uh, if it's if it's Tanaka that composed it. He just had this tune in like the back of his head for so long. He's like, I just, I don't remember using it in the Game Boy Camera. Let me just uh, try it for this or something. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, that's rad. Hearing it through. Oh man. Yeah, that's way cool. I like. I that. love that that riff there, like bass with that drums going on i mean maybe i should have explained this a little bit earlier too is a lot of times when i look at these i kind of look at them from a songwriting perspective okay that's kind of more my background is actually playing music right trying to write music so and i what i do is sometimes when i try to write new music i look at stuff i wrote five plus years ago and just see if i can adapt Go back it to the and, well yeah because i mean can't count as copying somebody if it's just yourself right so, well yeah I, I there you a, go i think a lot of creatives do that i do that for art sometimes i'll go back and look at old pieces and see what i liked about it to see if you can get inspiration or you kind of look at other people's stuff and and uh so i think that i mean i'm sure writers and all kinds of stuff they kind of go back to that idea think, well and see what's I think there that's, i think that's like kind of across the board not yeah. just in like composition because I'm, i was thinking about me it's software engineering i'm like I go back to stuff that I, I've worked on like years and years ago. And I'm like, oh man, I, I like that routine I use there. I gotta, mm -hmm. I gotta reuse that. Oh, but I found a better way to do it now. So yeah. like, let me kind of incorporate and change this around a little bit. But yeah, I think that that's kind of across the board. Maybe, I don't know, chefs do the same thing with cooking. They're like, oh, well, yeah. we found out this is this. Oh, you I know, used to really be into this nut. Like, let me go back and yeah, look at this one we again. Found out, really... like, this is actually poisonous and is horrible for your health. <laughs> so maybe we shouldn't use it anymore. Yeah. Anyways, no, that, that was a, a super fun track, though. Very like bubbly and happy. And I think uh -huh. that that melody is is just so catchy. I mean, it's going to be in my head for the next few weeks. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's awesome. what's great about a lot of these old video game tracks is the 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 looping beats and the melody that they create it's it's so easy to remember that they get stuck in your head and it's not like getting like miley cyrus stuck in your head or something like that that's really bad it's like this is really good like i can i could get this stuck in my head for a week and totally be happy with it it's just awesome cool so uh who's next on the list here james um i am going to go with which i think this is my final track i'm going to go with a track from terminator Awesome. On the Sega Genesis, and the track is called Tech Noir Disco. <laughs> That was Tech Noir Disco 
for Terminator on the Sega Genesis, composed by Matt Furness. Wow, that's man, I'm sweating, dude. Yeah, <laughs> sweating. It's a, I don't know it's if it's that it's track. I don't know if it's that it's like a million degrees in this room right now, or it's this track. But I think it's man. both. My shins just started sweating while <laughs> listening to that music. No, that was that was very cool. That was oh, man, intense. I think that fit the title of the track. Yeah, for sure. yeah, very, yeah, very much. Um, for me, I, I I don't know if any of you listeners remember I've, I've mentioned songs sounding very Terminator like a lot in the beginning of the podcast, the first couple episodes. We I'll did. never forget. Yeah, so I when I finally decided to pick a Terminator track, I, I wanted to pick something that really that I really liked that felt unique, but also I could see how it fit into the Terminator movie because the game is based on the first movie. This this track really reminded me of the the track where um, I don't know if you remember in the movie where um, the two main characters Sarah Connor and Kyle Reese are in the truck and they're chucking out like the C four yeah yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah like the Terminator's like back there and he's like swerving it and mm-hmm. it really reminded me of the music that I remember from that part but still felt very different and kind of video gamed up which I thought was really cool so, yeah so it wasn't like an arrangement of that song but it kind of had that feeling that that song was creating of that intense mm-hmm. like um he's coming to get me type yeah thing. it seems so, like a really frantic yeah kind yeah. of relentless track that yeah fits that, fits that vibe one thing i noticed too is in my left ear if we're listening to it with headphones on you know in my left ear i kept hearing this like springy noise it was like mm-hmm. boing 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 <laughs> boing boing like like over and over and over but like what that did was it made me concentrate on like that kind of frantic melody and then like i went back over that and it was just like i was getting like a head trip like mm-hmm. going back and forth and uh no that's just that track is that's that's a good pick dude i like i like that a lot no i like i said I, I come through this album pretty thoroughly to pick a track that i really really dug i mean it's it's an excellent soundtrack i really enjoy pretty much anything matt furnace does you know i mean he's done some huge amazing games you oh know. yeah we've mentioned before on the show but he's done games like marble madness hook predator 2 the simpsons bartman meets radioactive man lion king i mean and he's done a ton of amiga stuff a bunch of genesis um and even stuff like game gear and some c64 stuff like yeah that, he so. has he has a lot of really good stuff that was redone for the um roland mm-hmm. mt32 and um i was listening to some of that and man it's just just way out there man the guy has got some 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 talent it's really yeah i cool. mean and he's got some really big titles to his name and stuff like that so he's got a great collection anything that we play i mean in, in terminator i just i love terminator so and i think what uh matt furnace is is good about doing too is that when he ports stuff over from like another composer mm-hmm. he he really adds his own kind of feeling and, and vibe and, and and his almost when he's arranging stuff he almost puts his own composition into it and right. i think that that is what kind of sets him apart from just simply porting over a sound or or, right, right. or stuff. But when I think that was the case when we had we played tracks from was it Sensible Soccer? I think it was Sensible Soccer. And yeah, yeah in our or second, Dino Dini or yeah, something. It was, yeah, it was one of the it was in our soccer episode we had right. where he did some arrangements and it was just like this stuff is amazing and you know it's just great stuff with uh, Terminator like so many other games it's just really cool. So I think I'm about done gushing about Terminator and Matt Furness. So let's move on to you, Brian. I think this is your last track. Yeah, this is my last one. I was, it was really hard for me to decide. Um, I was between two. I had this Game Gear one that I really want to play, but I'm going to save it for the next one. Nice. Uh, but instead, I'm going to play a track from a game called Liberator on the Amiga. And the track is called Futura or Futura or however you want to pronounce mm-hmm. it. So let's listen to that. And we'll be right back.
heard Futura from Liberator on the Amiga, composed by Mark Shiki, developed and published by Scorpius Software. Wow, that was nuts. Awesome, right? Yeah, super awesome. Um, <sighs> There's like so many movements. Yeah. yeah. So many phases that that song goes through, that track. It's just... You know, when I was listening to it, when I first put it on, I was oh, this is wild. This is this is really cool. I ha- this has this really spacey feel to it, atmospheric almost, and mm-hmm. like you're going through space and like you're you're alone. And anyways, it's it's really cool. But then it it changes and like over the course of the four minutes that the song is, it just kind of goes through its own different B segment, and then it'll go back over to that melody. It's really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I liked how it it, it wasn't very repetitive uh, in that way because it kept moving on to the next part of the arrangement is really right cool. yeah yeah no i love the um those drums like that very uh 80s 90s drum sound too that choosh, like i just love that sound yeah it, it had just, a really like stomping drum like yeah. i like that and it had like those little uh like tom tom breakdown like that you yeah. Know, oh, yeah and then it would get back into it that was that was rad I yeah, like no this that. this that was, was definitely almost like a just like a demo piece like this is all the type of melodies and sounds i can make together like check this this one track out like my portfolio it's really cool yeah so mark cheeky actually did all of the um the composition for this game and he used pro tracker which is a uh, tool set or tracker for the amiga and uh he had a lot of tools to work with so he was able to be a lot more creative and not have to do all of the you know instrumentation like creation that mm-hmm. a lot of you know other drivers would have had to do um so that makes it nice scorpius software and uh scorpius productions it's an interesting company. And so uh, let me kind of tell you about it. So uh, Mark Shiki did all the music for the Scorpius games, but not only that, he also did the programming and the graphics for this game. Oh, wow. wow. So Scorpius is just him. Wow. It's, it's just one guy. It's like a, like a one man army, like a one man band. He's and the uh, yeah, so he is Scorpius. Yeah, yeah, he is Scorpius. And so he's done like a ton of stuff, a ton of Amiga stuff. A lot of it's public domain, which is really cool. So, he did a game called Spectrum. He did One on One, Turbo Thrust, Sentinel, Firefly, Task Force. All these games for Amiga. He did a bunch of Windows demos and mm-hmm. and different things. I'm not sure what sound tracker or what he what audio tools he used on the Windows stuff. Um, but uh, I know for Amiga, he used pretty much Pro Tracker only. Uh, this game itself, Liberator, is a shooter, mm-hmm. and it looks a lot like it looks a lot like 1942 or you know any game okay, that yeah. the shooters um, you know kind of vertical shooter genre. Uh, it's very basic. It's not, it doesn't look like it's that out of this world, like amazing or anything. Right. But the music for this is is just very, uh, very cool. And I actually found, so this guy, uh, Mark Shiki, he actually has a website that's still active. It looks old school, but it's right. it's still uh, it's still active and just seems like he's still doing, he's doing artwork. Mm-hmm. He's doing composition still. Like he has a ton of new music out for just stuff that he's done. It's very cool. He has like a SoundCloud account, I think, and you can like go listen to his stuff. And he also does, uh, he still has games that he's doing that are free for download. And wow. Yeah. And so the guy just looks like he's just enjoying life. Just yeah, doing just all the stuff it. he loves. And I mean, brilliant guy. He's a composer, developer, and artist. Yeah. And I mean, that's right there is like the trifecta of game development, right? So Yeah. I mean, and by that track, you could tell that he is very talented. Talented guy. It was really cool. I'll make sure that we have a link to his website in the show notes so you guys can check that out. But Cool. So we actually have one last track, and it's going to be a richer track. But first, let's do our plugs. Yeah, so thanks for listening. You can visit us online at pixelatedaudio.com, where we're going to have the show notes and the track list up for you to check out, including Richard's track. So definitely scope that. Yeah, and we're also on Twitter at Pixelated Audio, and I'm on there at Man Over Mars. And I am at Doki Doki Panic. And we're also on Instagram and Facebook. You can also subscribe to us on iTunes or Stitcher. And uh, the links for those are on the website. So if you don't want to you know, track us down, you have one place to go and you can subscribe through uh, those means. But uh, yeah, definitely check us out. We also appreciate a review on iTunes or Stitcher because that, that means a lot to us. It's kind of what fuels the fire and keeps us going. And it, it means a lot to us. It takes 30 seconds of your time. So definitely. Yeah, and we read all those. And we also look forward to seeing any um, suggestions for future episodes, games right. to cover, things like that. Richard, do you have any uh, plugs of your own? Um, well, you can find me on Twitter at Richard Hubs. So that's Richard and H U B B Z. Awesome. Um, should be some more links on there to like my mix cloud, which had recordings of when I did a VGM radio show at UCSB. Yeah, we'll put all those in the show notes to this episode. Nice. Yeah. yeah, awesome. So I, we wanted to say thank you very much for for being on this show. It it means a lot to us. You know, we were saying early on that hey, you know, you reached out to check out a show, 
but having you on just means so much more. And yeah. and and pixelated audio, it's me and James, we're we're the regulars here, but we, we kind of think of this show as is a community thing and we want to have everybody involved and it's really it means a lot to us that you came and you had some awesome track to share with us. So oh, thank awesome. you. Awesome. Yeah, thank you guys so much for inviting me out here. I'm glad I was able to make it up here today and uh, you know, had a great time talking video games and video game music with you guys. I loved all your tracks throughout the series and today for sure. And so I'm glad you guys enjoyed some of my stuff too. Oh yeah. yeah so, so what one. do you have uh, to play for us next? It's our, our last track to leave us with. All right. So this one is a track from Grindstormer or V5, which I think is the, the Japanese, the Japanese title. Yeah. Right. And this uh, was actually originally on the arcade, right? Yes. I think it came out for arcade in 93. Okay. And then this particular version of this, this track is from the Genesis version in awesome. 94 composer Masahiro Yuge, but this is Grindstormer, uh, Moon and Stars. You know, the, the thing about this track, too, is that uh, it is very progressive, but at the same time is a great way to end the show because mm-hmm. when we were listening to it, James, you, you had made a comment like, wow, what, like, what an awesome track. Yeah. To, to leave off with. No, I think Richard pick a, picked a great song to start the show with, and this was uh, a very good exit track. I could see it as almost like a credits type thing, and it's very kind of like, almost like thanks for listening type thing. So Cool. Well, thank you guys for listening, and uh, we'll have a new show for you out, and it'll be our, our one-year anniversary yeah, show. Yeah, it's been one year. Yeah, so you were, Richard, you were on our, our last of our, our birth year. Yeah. Our, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, thanks again. Awesome. Congratulations, guys, on the year. Yeah, thank Thanks. you. We got some big stuff planned for next year. So. Oh, my God. We got some big stuff. Anyways, thank you guys for listening, and we will see you again soon. <laughs>